Dr. Carano is an associate professor with a joint appointment in botany and geology and geophysics. Now, I think that's too few, for an examination of her scholarly publications quickly reveals that she should also be in the zoology department, for she has to her credit the discovery of a new species of termite in Ethiopia, Mastotermes ethiopicus. And perhaps she should also be in the atmospheric science department at UW, for she studies how to identify shifts in climate and the way they impact the biosphere. How can someone be so multi-talented? Well, I think it's obvious. She began life as a kid who was fascinated with dinosaurs. And she grew up to become a paleontologist, a paleobotanist to be specific. Her lab is full of fossil leaves, stems, and other plant parts. The termite she helped discover lived in the Miocene period, roughly 15 million years ago. Yeah, give or take a couple million. But perhaps the most significant source of Ellen's talent is that she learned to look before she leaps. Or to put it in scientific terms, she asks questions before she goes herring off into the field. She wants to understand the prehistoric world in the same way that we try to understand our own. So she takes questions from research into modern conditions and applies them to the far, far past. And even though the layered character of geological deposits pushes one to ask questions of stasis, of stable periods, she's actually helping to create an approach to paleontology that investigates change and alteration, that sees the world's character as dynamic, not static. Here's some statistics about Dr. Carano. Dr. Carano was hired at the University of Wyoming in 2014. The same year, she became a research associate at the Smithsonian Institution in DC. She did her PhD work at Pennsylvania State University, and her undergraduate degrees are from the University of Chicago. She also is a major force behind the Bearded Lady Project. Tonight, she will speak to us on tropical forests in Wyoming, only 55 million years ago. Dr. Carano. Thank you, Paul. So I was 10 years old the first time I read Jurassic Park, and yes, I did read it many times after that, and the book terrified me. And not because dinosaurs were running around eating people, for 10-year-old me, that was okay, but it was because dinosaurs were running around. And I was so scared that my dream job wouldn't exist by the time I grew up. <laughs> now, thankfully, we haven't figured out how to clone dinosaurs. We also haven't invented time machines, but we do have shovels. And so we can use our shovels to look at the layers of Earth and see how it's been at different points in its history. So here we are today. There's the University of Wyoming campus, but also generalizing out across Wyoming. And so in the lower, drier areas, we have our sagebrush ecosystems. If we go by the rivers, you see your cottonwood trees and maybe some aspens. And then up in the mountains, and you have your forests, mostly conifer forests. But if we were to go back in time, we would see very, very different things. So let's just take a quick run back. And then we'll, we'll focus on the time period that I look at. So going back a million years, that's that top earth right there, big ice sheets, and running around Wyoming, we would see things like woolly mammoths. If we went back 56 million years ago to that time period that I study, much, much warmer, so notice sea levels are really high because we don't have ice sheets at the poles, and we would see these tropical forests in Wyoming. Go back 200 million years ago, and there's our friends, the dinosaurs, running around. Further back, and if we leave Wyoming and go to coastal areas, we would see our early ancestors coming out of the ocean onto land, so the first limbed animals. Go back even further, 500 million years ago, and there's our first vertebrate ancestor, a thing called Pykea. And then go back even further 600 million years ago and life was pretty boring. No multi-celled organisms, just a lot of single-celled bacterial and algal mats. Now, as probably all of you know, Wyoming is a fantastic place to look at paleontology and Earth history. And so historically, here's what our fossil collectors look like. 
And since arriving at the University of Wyoming, I've really been trying to break that stereotype of who is a paleontologist, and that's the Bearded Lady Project. There's some cards in the back about it. Check out our website, watch trailers. Um, so here's what some of our paleontologists at the University of Wyoming look like. And I notice I've got a lot of uh, young women in the audience. Don't let people tell you what you can do and can't do. You can be a scientist, and it's an awesome job. So, yes. <laughs> Woohoo! So here we are, th those of us at Wyoming, and then also across the nation, a lot of really, really wonderful paleontologists. Okay, so looking at Wyoming's fossil record, unparalleled in the world. So what you're looking at here, this is a map put together by Laura Vietti, our geological museum director. And each dot on that map is a fossil collection. The size of the dot is, um, r relates to how big that collection is, and the color of the dot is how old it is. So our time scale's on the bottom, old is on that side, young's on this side. So you'll note lots and lots of dots, over 3,000 fossil collections from Wyoming. And these are just the things that are in museums. Many of these are at the UW Geological Museum, but they're all over the world. Big collections at the Smithsonian, the American Museum of Natural History, the Field Museum, and even international museums. And now looking at those dots, you'll note that a lot of them are orange in color. And that is the time period I study. So looking at um, from when the dinosaurs died 66 million years ago to about 34 million years ago. We call this time period the Paleogene, and it's divided into the Paleocene, Eocene, and Oligocene epochs. And in Wyoming, we have particularly well represented those first two, the Paleocene and Eocene. So this is when Earth was really warm. So here's that map of Earth again, no ice caps, high sea levels, very, very warm temperatures all over the world. And so I've been very interested in looking at the fossils of Wyoming during this time period. Okay, so I'm not a vertebrate paleontologist. I don't walk around looking at the ground looking for little teeth sticking out at me. I tend to drive around and look for scenes like this. So this landscape is someplace where I would just go gaga and want to run up with my shovel and start digging holes in the ground and see if I can find plant fossils. And you guys have a lot of rocks around here that look like that. This is probably very familiar to you. So note in, in the bottom here, you see that darker layer. It's a coal layer. It's not a high grade coal. You wouldn't want to mine that. But that coal tells us there was a lot of plant material. Now, coals are not good for finding plant fossils in because there's just too much plant material. What we need are the plant material mixed with silt, sands, muds. So looking in those layers above the coals. And those tend to represent either lake deposits, they're floodplains, they're swamps, um, but, but not the like swamps where all you have is plant material falling in. And so you're probably asking me, okay, well you see this landscape, you go, you're like, yay, fossils, how do you know how old it is? Well, the best way that we could know is if we're lucky enough to find volcanic ashes. So here I am in the field with one of my former postdocs, and we've dug a nice little hole right there. We got very dirty doing that because coal is dirty. And then look in that, that inset up there, and you see that white layer. So that's a volcanic ash. It represents an instant in time when that volcano erupted, ash got laid down, and there are crystals in the ash that we can date. We can use radioactive dating and figure out exactly how old that layer is. So that's the best case scenario. Unfortunately, working in places like Wyoming, there aren't a lot of volcanoes nearby, and there weren't 50 million years ago. And so a lot of what we rely on is looking at what plants and animals we find, and especially the mammals. Mammals are, can be really diagnostic. They lived during a short range of time, and that can help us tell where we are in time. 
So we find nice, nice looking plant deposits, we figure out how old they are, and then we start the hard work. So we quarry it out. And so you're looking at some examples of quarries. So you dig down the layers on top or the ones that don't have very good plant fossils. You expose a bench of the layer that does have good plant fossils in it. Then we very carefully extract the, the rocks from that layer and split them open. So we go through a lot of rocks over the course of a summer and we wrap up all our beautiful fossils in toilet paper. Non-perforated toilet paper is the best because it won't rip. And we take them back to our, our university and to the lab to study. So I'm going to show some pretty pictures of the plant fossils and I'll also note now I brought some show and tell on the piano up there are some Wyoming plant fossils for you all to look at. Okay, so, um, so on the left there, you see that's a, a fossil leaf of a tropical bean species, and that is uh, found in rocks about 50 million years ago outside of Warlands. Over here is an extinct sycamore, and oh, it got cut off, but that is from the mountains outside of Dubois, where today you would only find conifers. Some other pretty, very tropical looking plants. So upper left, I don't know what type of plant that is other than the shape of it looks tropical and it looks like a vine. That, that sort of leaf or often viney plants. Um, lower left, I can tell you what that is. That is a climbing fern called Ligodium, which today you find in places like Florida and Central America. And there it is, 50 million years ago, east of Shoshone. And for those of you who have been around Shoshone, there's sagebrush and there's dirt, and that's about it. So very, very different environment. And then over here, when I first split it, I was like, oh my god, I found asparagus. It is not asparagus, it, but it's a horsetail, and also found near Shoshone. So then once we find these leaves, what are things we can do with them? Um, as Paul alluded to, we can use them to reconstruct climate. So for more than 100 years, botanists have known that leaves look different in different parts of the world. And if we were to go down to the tropics, we would see a lot of leaves with smooth edges, like the one on the left. Whereas if we come up into higher latitudes and cooler climates, we would see more leaves like the ones on the right with these serrate margins. So things like sycamores, maples, um, beeches, aspen. And so in the 1970s, a paleobotanist did a transect of, well, he did one transect in Asia and one in North America, looking at forests growing in different climates and looking at how many smooth margin species do you have versus serrate margins. And there's a beautiful correlation between the percent of smooth margin leaves and temperature. So in the fossil record, we can go and collect our leaves, divide them up into species, figure out what percent of those species are serrate versus smooth, and then compute what temperature would be like. And so that's something that I did in the record of the Bighorn Basin. So we have our time scale. Those dots are different plant sites that I've worked on. So going from about 58 and a half to 52 and a half million years ago. And you can see temperature fluctuations. And you can see these temperatures are much warmer. So that axis up there is a mean annual temperature in Celsius. And so these ecosystems would look a lot like, well, there's the reconstructions of those ecosystems. Now, another thing that we can do with our fossils, and you might have noticed in that one I showed you, there are those giant black rings. What are those? Well, we can use modern systems to help us figure that out. And so if you go to modern forests, you might notice a lot of bugs running around chewing the leaves or interacting with them in other ways. So these holes right there were most likely chewed by insects. And we know that that damage occurred during the plant's lifetime and not after death because there's that dark rim. So unlike us, when plants get injured, they can't you know, fix it. 
They put a scab around the injured area, but they can't grow that leaf tissue back. And that scab is thicker and tougher than the rest of the leaf, so you see that scab preserved as a fossil. Okay, so our, our pretty little uh, insects eating the plants. On the bottom are some other examples of how insects interact with plants. So the two pictures on the left are examples of galls. And what that is, is an insect weighs an egg inside of a leaf, and then something about the egg laying process or hormones released by the egg in the larvae cause the plant to grow a tumor. So there's the tumor, egg inside, egg hatches, larvae very happily lives in the tumor, eating the wall and being protected from predators and parasites. And then it eventually hatches out. Over here we see a leaf mine. It's kind of a similar interaction. In this case, the female insect laid an egg in the leaf. The egg hatches and the larvae eats and poops its way through and eventually hatches out. So these kinds of interactions we see in the modern, we see in fossils as well. So some examples of leaf galls and leaf mines. Now sometimes the damage is so specific that we can actually tie it to an insect group. And so this is some work done by my PhD advisor. So obviously what you're seeing right there is a living plant and insect. Leaf is green, insect is smushy. It's a ginger leaf and a hispine beetle larvae. And that hispine beetle larvae makes these very characteristic feeding patterns. So we see those on leaves today. We can go back to the fossil record of Wyoming. Go back 50 million years ago, there were ginger plants all over Wyoming. And those ginger plants had that same feeding mark. And we can even go back before the dinosaurs died and you still see ginger leaves with hispine beetles feeding on them. Now because it's just after Halloween, I have to share my favorite uh, plant-insect-fungus interaction story. So this is something that is observed today in Thailand. You have these zombie ants with death grips. So what happened was there's this fungus, Ophiocordyceps unilateris. Okay, so the, the fungal spores, you know, spewed out through the air, land on an ant, so this particular species listed up there, and some of them, so land on the ant, fungus starts growing into the ant's brain and it takes over the ant's brain. And it tells the ants, no, you don't want to you know, wander around the forest and eat like you usually do. You want to go 25 centimeters above the forest floor, which is where temperature and humidity are optimal for fungal growth. You want to go on the underside of a leaf and just bite down on it and hang on and don't ever move again. Fungus continues to grow, eats the ant's brain, ant dies. Um, fungus decides it's time to reproduce. So we have this fungal stalk growing out of the ant's head with the capsule on it where the spores are. Capsule bursts, spores go out to infect the next generation of ants. Isn't that an awesome story? <laughs> yeah. So there was a whole National Geographic article on the zombie interactions, and this was one of them, and they've got a bunch of other ones in there too that are so cool. <laughs> but those don't have to do with plants and insects, so I can't talk about them here. However, you might be wondering why did I just tell you this story? Because in 40 million year old fossils from Germany, you find these damage patterns that look very similar to what the modern damage looks like from these zombie ants with death grips. So, pretty cool story. And I think this is the only example we know of seeing three trophic levels all interacting at the same time in the fossil record. All right, so those were our best case scenarios where we can really look at something characteristic and figure out what exactly was going on, what insect was doing it. A lot of the time, I'm looking at fossils like this where there's chewing marks, it's, you know, tons and tons of different insects can do those kinds of things. We should not abandon hope. Um, 
So for the, the last portion of the talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can quantify herbivory if we just see this and if we can't tell what insects are doing things. And then give a specific example looking at climate change in Wyoming and how that's affected the ecosystems. Okay, so we have our bug bites on the leaves. One thing that we can do is we can just measure how much area was damaged by an insect. And now that we have fabulous smart screens that you can trace things on, it goes really quite quickly. Another thing that we can do is we can look at different morphologies of herbivory. And so just like we would divide our leaves up into plant species, we can divide our damage marks up into damage species or damage morphotypes, or DTs as we call them. And I've been part of a group looking at interactions in the modern realm and seeing how does the diversity of damage relate to the diversity of insects. And thankfully it does. So there's this wonderful um, system around the world of these canopy cranes. Um, we went to the ones in Panama, there's two of them, one on the um, uh, Pacific side, one on the Caribbean side. And there's a picture of the canopy crane. So you're in a little box hanging off the end of it. it you know, so the box is on the ground. It picks you up. It can swing you around so you can access all over the forest canopy. And in the forest canopy is where those insects are eating the leaves. So that, that's what it looks like looking down from the box that you're in. Um, we saw sloths there, and they really are that adorable. <laughs> Kristen Bell has it right. Um, and so what we did, we have our very high-tech kite-like thing. You hold that under the tree, beat the tree, catch the insects that fall out of it. Then we brought those insects back to the lab, put them in bags with leaves of the tree that we captured them on, and looked at what... Um, what marks those insects made. And so then we could compare the insect richness on a species versus the damage richness. So each of those points there is a plant species. They're color coded based on the sites. And you can see that there's a good correlation between how many insects we captured on the tree and how many damage marks we observed in the lab by those insects. It's not a perfect correlation because there are some insects that can make many different types of feeding marks. So lots of different hole sizes or chewings on the margin. And then also thinking about like if you have a hole that big, there are lots of different species of insects that could do that. So not a one-to-one -one relationship, but a good positive relationship. And so as our damage richness increases, our insect richness is also increasing. Okay, so let's now go to Wyoming's fossil record and see what happens when climate changes. So I already showed you this temperature record I constructed by looking at the margins of the leaves. So nine different sites in the Bighorn Basin, 50, 58 and a half to 52 and a half million years old. And you'll notice there's some warmings and coolings. And now, um, our record from Wyoming is very comparable to what's going on in other parts of the world at the same time. And so this plot here is looking at what ocean temperatures were through this time period. And that's done by looking at the microorganisms in the ocean and their isotopic compositions. So what was happening in Wyoming was not unique. This was going on all over. And we have these two warming events. There's a very abrupt warming right at the Paleocene-Eocene boundary, which we call the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, or PETM. And then you have the warmest time period of the last 65 million years, the ECO, which stands for Early Eocene Climatic Optimum. So we've really paid a lot of attention to that PETM event. If we look at it in an ocean core, here's what you see. It's very obvious when you hit the PETM. You go from limestone-rich rocks to shaley rock. 
And then if we were to look at the carbon and oxygen isotopes, so isotope, um, it's a uh, so the different atoms that are the same elements can have a different number of neutrons. And depending on how many neutrons they have, that's what isotope they are. So carbon and oxygen can have different numbers of neutrons. And by looking at how the, the isotope ratios change through time, we can tell about, say, for carbon, the carbon cycle. And right at the PETM, there's a big change in carbon isotopes. And this tells us that a lot of carbon was released into the atmosphere at this time. Now, carbon dioxide and methane are both greenhouse gases, so that would change temperatures. And we see that looking at the leaves. The oxygen isotopes also tell us about temperatures. Okay, so I was interested in, you know, how do these temperature changes, and especially how does the PETM affect our plants and our insects? So at each of those sites, we dug big quarries, we identified at least 450 flowering plant leaves, and then counted the number of occurrences of each damage type on each leaf. Oh, slides are a little bit out of order. Sorry about that, but you probably, you know, you heard me talk about the PETM, and you may have wondered, where did all this carbon come from? We don't know. Here are our best guesses. So there's a lot of carbon stored in a compound called um, methane hydrate on the ocean floor. So the ocean could have burped out the carbon. Um, carbon dioxide is released by volcanoes. There was volcanism going on during this time period, so it could have come from there. Uh, peats and coals. You burn those, you release carbon into the atmosphere. So you, you all know there are tons of coal beds around here. Those were forming in the Paleocene. If those caught fire, that could have been a source of carbon. Or it could have been a combination of the above. And so what we do know, so during the PETM, 4,500 petagrams of carbon were released, and that's comparable to what we have today remaining in our fossil fuel reservoirs. Carbon dioxide levels increased two to five times. So thinking about the ocean cores going from limestone to shales, so that uh, limestone is getting dissolved as the ocean becomes more acidic because of the carbon. Uh, warming of 4 to 8 degrees Celsius, so that's like 8 to 12 uh, Fahrenheit. Depending on where you are in the world, you see a different amount of warming. In Wyoming, we have about 5 Celsius, so about 10 degrees. And this whole event lasted 200,000 years. So the PETM had a big effect on biota. It was first recognized not through looking at isotopes, but by looking at the little microorganisms in the ocean. And it was noticed there was a big extinction of these microorganisms. People wanted to know why they went extinct, and so then they started doing things like measuring those isotopes. Um, so th those are our, our friends, the, the for foraminifera. If we look at even smaller things in the ocean, so these are our nanoplankton, they actually did pretty well. They had this burst of evolution during the PETM. Coming up onto land, looking at animals. So this was a time of huge animal migrations. And so in North America at the PETM is the first time that we get primates, horses, and the even-toed ungulates. So in addition to getting a lot of animals moving around in first appearances here in North America, we also see shrinking of body size. And so those are some of the, the horses that were running around during the PETM. And as one of my vertebrate paleontology colleagues told me, you went from having dog-sized horses to cat-sized horses. And yes, I would like one as a pet. <laughs> so now let's turn to the plant and insect record. And so here we are in the Paleocene. We tend to have somewhat low diversity floras. We have some conifers. The, the one all the way on the left is another type of sycamore. 
Uh, the thing in the middle, it's called Cercidophyllum. The somewhat common name is Katsuro, which you probably haven't heard of either. Um, these are only found in the wild in China, but they're a very popular ornamental plant, and you do tend to see them on a lot of college campuses in slightly warmer climates than the University of Wyoming. So this is our typical Paleocene flora. Then we come into the PETM and we have this very, very tropical looking environment. So lots of bean plants, lots of things that we know that usually lived at more southerly latitudes. Then we come into the Eocene and it's back to looking just what the Paleocene looked like. So the interpretation is that with warming, you have those tropical plants at lower latitudes coming northward into Wyoming and then going back south again as temperatures cooled. Looking at the insect record, okay, so pretty pictures of insect herbivore damage on fossils. All the way on the left is that temperature curve that I made. Um, oh, and so, so our axis is time. We always put older things on the bottom, younger up, thinking about how the layers on Earth are, older rocks or below younger rocks. Okay, so we've got time going up. The PETM is that dotted line right there. So there's our temperature curve, just number of plant species, but we won't worry too much about that. Let's look at the number of insect damage types. And so you see that curve, um, well, so you see three different curves. Maybe I should start there. The, the black set of points are just looking at all types of damage on the leaves. The gray dots are looking at only leaf mines. So where the female insect laid the egg, the larvae ate and pooped its way through. And then the thing in the middle are specialized herbivory types. So we look at these damage types and the ones that are modern or similar to those are made by insects that can only eat one plant species. Okay, but regardless of which of those three sets of points you look at, there's a very, very strong correlation between the damage diversity, also then the insect diversity and temperature. And so again, we probably have this migration story. It gets warmer, you have these diverse tropical insect populations coming northward. And then it gets cooler and they go away, and then it gets warmer and they come back again. Now looking at how much damage is there on leaves, and so here are my numbers. So it's the percent of leaves at each of those sites that top row is don't have damage, next row is do have damage. And the HB is our PETM site. So note that that one is quite high compared to a lot of the others. And then just look at the columns or we'll look down the column. So how, what percent of leaves have one damage type, two, three, four, et cetera? And it's only in the PETM where you have leaves with lots and lots of different types of damage on them. And then last, um, we, were, we measured what percent of each leaf was eaten by insects. And so the, I've highlighted the PETM site as orange. We only did this on some of the Bighorn Basin sites, and then we went into the literature and looked at what some other people had done. It is time intensive even with our smart screens. Take home point, whether we're looking at lumping all of the species together or looking at an average damage on individual species, you get a lot more of that leaf chewed during the PETM when it's warm and when carbon dioxide levels were high. So now we did have a lot of plant turnover in this interval. We decided to try to trace a single plant species and look at how the herbivory changed. So this is Populus cinnamomoides. It's an extinct species of aspen. And 
Oh, it got cut off a little bit at the bottom, but we were able to compare the PETM from the Bighorn Basin with another warm time, the early Eocene climatic optimum, also in the Bighorn Basin, and then a site from the Wind River Basin that also had those fossils, that fossil species. And let's just highlight the last column here. So about twice as much herbivory during the PETM than during other time periods. So it's not just a function of plant species changing even on a single species. So this was a, a tremendously dynamic time in Earth's history. Things change a lot when it gets warm and when CO2 levels rise. Um, and so, so just to close this PETM story, we worked with, um, with uh, artists from National Geographic to put together a reconstruction. And so you're looking at a panel right here. It's not a moment in time. You're moving through time as you come across. And so we have the Paleocene, uh, a warm kind of wet environment. We come into the PETM, it gets hotter and drier, and we get all our bean trees coming in. We also get things like the primates and the horses. And then moving forward into the Eocene, and the plants go back to kind of what they were in the Paleocene, but those animals are there to stay. So here we are today. We get out our shovels, we see what Earth has been like in the past. A really interesting time to look at is this really warm time 56 million years ago, because that might tell us about where we're headed in the next 100 years. And so just to close, um, so my lab at the University of Wyoming, we've been kind of colonizing the West for paleobotany. We've been spreading out across the state. Um, very good luck in the Bighorn, Wind River, and Hannah Basins where there's a lot of public lands. Um, we also have a project down in New Mexico, again on public lands. Now you'll note the Powder River Basin where we are right now, there's tons and tons of awesome, awesome fossils. And, well, I think there are lots of awesome fossils. I know you all have a lot of awesome rocks out here, but a lot of it is on private land. And so if any of you do have big ranches or know people who do and have plant fossils perhaps on them, please feel free to get in touch with me. I would love to see how things in the Powder River Basin compare with the Bighorn, the Wind River, the Hanna, and even down in New Mexico. And so that is all I have to say. I will take questions, and I think I have a little bit of time. So, any questions? Yes? Can it be creams? Yes. Are those just for scientists, or can it <laughs> Where is the one in the U.S.? It looked like the um, Let's see. It's, it's up in Washington State. It says Wind River, USA. I assume that is, that is definitely not our Wind River because it's in the wrong place. Um, so my guess is that if you pay your money, I mean, so we, we rent out crane time. And so we paid the money and we were able to use them. I think priority is given to researchers, but you know, it might be worth a try. Um, actually, the, if, if you're ever in Panama City, uh, so the one of them is right in the heart of Panama City, and maybe being in more of a tourist destination, maybe it's possible there. Yes? What is the advantage of having serrated leaves versus... <laughs> Boy, would we love to know. So this, this trend has been observed for more than 100 years, but it's something, it, it's a, an observation, and what's driving that, we don't know. Um, I think the best idea out there is that, um, that things with, with toothed margins are able to expand a little bit faster and it gives them a little bit of an advantage early on in the growing season. And since you have such a short growing season as you get into cooler climates, but no, we, we don't know. <laughs> Yes. Um, do you also um, study pollen? Do I study pollen? 
I do not personally study pollen, but I work with a lot of people who do. And um, so, so pollen, I think everybody knows what pollen is. It's what bothers you during allergy season. And pollen is really, really resistant to decay. It has a very hard coat on it. And so, in a lot of our rocks where we don't find leaf fossils, we do still find pollen. And we can go, you know, build really, really high resolution records, look at pollen, um, and capture some of the vegetation that way. One of the downsides of pollen is that it's hard to get it down to the species level. We can tell what family of plants it was, but oftentimes we can't tell species. So having that leaf record where we can divide it into species and the pollen record together has you know, some really good, good complements to doing both together. And so do you do any grasses? You didn't mention it. I did not mention grasses because I'm working mostly 50 million years ago. And so there were grasses around then, but they weren't an important part of the ecosystem. So it's only about 35 million years ago once you, when you start getting grasslands expanding. Thank you all. <laughs>